All right. Now it says I'm live. Hmm. So I think there's going to be like a two or three minute delay, perhaps, between when I started and when I didn't. Let me know, guys, um, if the... Let me know if the... Um, what do you call it? The audio is good. The video is good. And in case I'm repeating myself, a video cannot start without me doing a click click. Hello everyone and welcome to BHD Studios and welcome to this post conversation of the 2021, the second one, 2021 X Summit, but they call this the Prime and it felt like a Apple event. So let's call it the Fuji Apple event. Linda, uh, thanks for joining and everyone else for joining and waiting. Um, I kind of made a mistake, I think, when I started this live show. It's weird. I'm not very good with OBS. The more I use it, the better I will get. But it basically, I hit start uh, streaming, but I also had to hit start streaming like on OBS and on YouTube. So I'm not sure if there's a delay or not. So uh, AV and video, good. Thank you so much, uh, Paul. I appreciate that. And uh, Linda, you're still there because it's a good time for you, right, Linda? T about lunchtime or so. So enjoy your lunch while you watch this. And um, Lonnie calling the GFX now large frame. Although he did say larger frame. I think that's kind of funnier since it's like more sharp. Or does that say sh more, more sharp and larger frame? I love these adjectives that uh, are being added uh, to these maybe it sounds better in Japanese than in English. So a gadge D how's it going? Um, OC two fish 07 good evening from London England to everyone. Yeah, welcome from the UK This is really late for my friends in Europe It's getting to be I guess it's not too bad in the in Europe and perfect for North America Unless you're working. I am wearing my my Fuji film uh, T-shirt that Francis from Fujifilm made and we got these back in 2018, but a few film simulations need to be added um, Acros was temporarily discontinued and then brought back to life So they actually should say Acros to the actual film. I mean, um, but anyways, I thought I would wear this in homage to the X event and um, Didn't wear a hat because sometimes people say Taka why are you always wearing a hat? I don't always wear a hat often when I'm out and about I wear one and I always have one nearby in case I need to put one on. And uh, let me see here. Midnight here in Singapore. Oh, it's it's late. So Chin Yi, thank you so much for joining from Singapore. And um, let's kind of go over what happened on the X Live event. I don't know. Um, I have to. Let me just do something here, guys. Um, videos. I, I don't know how I can watch this. X live and also watch um, like get your video I, I need help someone help me with doing these live shows um, good evening from Northwest England love your comparison review 3335 oh thank you yeah so let's quickly get because this is going to be about the post uh, show of the X summit and the way I'm going to share my screen is I'm going to bring up my and this is what happens is when I bring up my um, when I bring up my, just give me a second, guys. Let me just, here we go. When I bring up my OBS, here we go. So this should, you should be able to see right now, right? Are you guys seeing the, uh, I took screenshots of the show. So let's talk about the GFX 50S Mark II. So obviously I knew that this was in development. I couldn't talk about it. And um, what do you guys think? Let me know in the comments. What do you think of a Mark II using the shell of the 100S and using the older sensor, but adding IBIS using the newer battery, which is great. I'm not that enthused about the button dial layout of the 100S and those of us that are Fujifilm X shooters for like years, we're not used to PSAM, right? It's just kind of, 
people coming in from Canon and Nikon and Sony are used to it, but I prefer more dials to control things instead of having a large LCD screen with a virtual ISO dial. I'd rather have a physical ISO dial. So I am disappointed. The GFX, the original GFX 50S, 100% has better dial button layout. The new 50S Mark II has got rid of the ISO dial, doesn't have a, a D-pad. A um, lot of things have been missing, right? It doesn't have a dedicated uh, exposure compensation dial, but it does have the new battery and it has IBIS, 6.5 stops of IBIS, which is great. So now I'm conflicted. If I can get a good price on the 50S, which was overpriced, right? $5,500. Has anyone checked to see what the price on the 50S, the older 50S is now? Because at $5,500, the new 50S Mark II is $4,000. So it's $1,500 cheaper. Um, and um, uh, I was even saying that the, the original 50S has got to dr drop at least $1,500 to $2,000 or no one's going to buy it. So now the new 50S Mark II is out. The older 50S, I'm going to just check that out now. Let's just let's just see. Let's just go to B&H, our friends at B&H video, and let's type in GFX 50S. And let's just see what the price is. See if Fujifilm has dropped the price. No, I see the Mark II. Mark II, and no, it's funny. The 50S is still $5,500. So Fujifilm is refusing to budge on that price on that body. So uh, that's um, that's uh, too bad. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just reading the, the Japanese there. Um, let me sorry. Let me just uh, start the slideshow here. So, 50s uh, more than full frame or fuller frame or large format, whatever Fujifilm wants to call it. I thought that was kind of cute. Um, it this is kind of the the thing that I was talking about is that the 100s and the 50s and the 50s Mark II shared the same sensor size. So when you double the amount of resolution something has to give. So the older sensor actually has larger pixels and more space between pixels, which actually help with the, uh, uh, the, uh, the noise, the signal noise ratio. So, um, all things being equal, minusing the resolution, the 50, the older 50 megapixel sensor should do better in, in noise control and as well as low light, even though the ISO range is the same. Although software could sort of hide that, and that's where you have to look at the the raw files without noise being applied. So, I personally, if I could choose between the 50s Mark II and the 100s, uh, I would pick the 50s 100%. And that's what I said in my other video, right? Even with the older 50s, that I would pick the the older one. So, um, and Gadge D talking about the PSAM dialed future camera body instead of just the XS10. And the 50s Mark II, yeah, I hope not. The XH2, I hope it will be more X Fujifilm X series DNA and avoid the PSAM. I just I don't like it. I think if you are used to the Fujifilm system, which is based on the old film system, which is kind of legacy, and that's kind of why I like Fujifilm that I prefer not having a PSAM. Although even film cameras had PSAM, that's where they originally came from. It wasn't a digital invention. Uh, most of my film autofocus SLRs have PSAM, but I just prefer proper dials. That's that's all. Um, anyway, so let's move on. Uh, see, so large format sensor, so they do call it large format. I think it's cuter if they call it larger format. <laughs> funnier and then there's full frame so it's 1.7 times larger than full frame or 35 millimeter i think the term large format came out of full frame sounds bigger than medium right if someone says what's bigger medium or full and you didn't know anything about photography full sounds bigger right so even full frame is kind of a misnomer uh i preferred it when it was people would just call it 35 mil uh size but uh full frame kind of stuck and so now fujifilm is sitting there going how can we make medium sound larger than full and their way is calling it larger format right as so here we're talking about the um the actual pixel size 
Um, and of course, even in uh, large form, uh, full frame, 35 millimeter, there is different uh, pixel size and talk about the uh, pitch of the pixels and some, you know, this says generally 3.76 is the uh, the pitch and they said that because some of the high end uh, DSLRs and mirrorless that have lower um, pixels, like 16 megapixels, 20 megapixels, like the uh, EOS, uh, the 1DX mark, whatever that is, with only, I think it's only 20 megapixels, they have larger uh, pixels, which I'm assuming is probably close to, or maybe even larger than the medium format uh, sensor that Fujifilm is using, the 5.3, uh, the, the pitch on their uh, sensors. So this is true, the, the, the pixel size difference between full frame and medium format for the, the average uh, lar uh, medium, uh, full frame sensor. So let me just try to catch up here. Next to though, we just call it the largest format. That's funny. I like that. Although there are larger, for those of you that might not know, there are larger. So Fujifilm and Hasselblad on their X1D and their replaceable back system does use a uh, basically a 44 by 33 millimeter uh, medium format sensor. Leica has their, um, I think it's like. 40 millimeter by 50 or something out of 40 by 55 or 45, something like that. And there is a larger uh, medium format sensor. I forgot the size of it, even bigger than what the 44 and 33 is. So even amongst medium format, there isn't just one size. And so there are multiple sizes, the different aspect ratios, even like on the Leica, which I prefer, but Leica is not investing much money in their medium format because it needs a lot of R&D, right? And so it'd be kind of cool if Leica with the Elmont Alliance uh, decided to join the GFX mount, if Fujifilm will allow them to, and create a Leica medium format using the Fujifilm mount. Wouldn't that be kind of cool? And make it sort of like the de facto medium format or larger format uh, digital sensor format. I think that'd be cool. Um, I'm just going to skip through here. It was kind of cool showing the dynamic range of uh, pulling up the shadows, zooming in. If you guys saw that um, on the uh, the X Summit Prime. And then even talking about um, um, being able to... Uh, the, the micro lens that is on top of the photodiode, that itself makes a difference of how much... Um, uh, image uh, detail is captured. And I, I didn't really think about this, right? The little micro lenses and the shape of it and the design of it and how that will affect uh, the overall image quality, right? So when you get images like this, what makes the GFX so special? Well, this is one of it is that they actually have the specialized micro lenses. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I'm going to try to get through this as quick as possible while keeping an eye on uh, your comments as well. And so... Um, Dedicated dials, yeah, I know. I'm kind of, I'm kind of torn, but just like the D-pad, um, you know, like Fujifilm was just dropping it, and so that is the future. Uh, if you like the full, like, I'm actually happy about the the XT30 Mark II in that it wasn't an all new body, but also I'm not happy because everything they added to the XT30, which was basically a new LCD screen and a larger uh, built-in buffer, they could have just updated the firmware on the X-T30. So just like the uh, Fujifilm X-E2, I think it's called the S, which was kind of a kind of a silly upgrade. I think they just added Bluetooth to it, and then they call it a, a 2 version. Um, that was a hardware change. The uh, X-T30 Mark II, I really feel disappointed that Fujifilm didn't just update the firmware. That was really kind of almost an Apple move, right? It's kind of a cash grab to me. And um, I wrote an article for Fuji Love under the uh, Takis Corner article about the future of the Kaizen firmware updates. And I think in a way it's dead. Uh, read that article if you haven't, uh, but you have to be subscribed to Fuji Love. But uh, they could have updated the firmware on the X-T30 to give the latest, greatest, because it has the same sensor and the processor as the X-E4 and the X-S10 and the X-T4 and the X-100V. And it, ha it has the same uh, processor, so it can handle the same firmware. 
but they decided to basically abandon it and then make a Mark II version. Hopefully there's a huge discount on the X-T30. Um, if so, someone can create a hack and add the new firmware to the X-T30. That'd be awesome. Um, I sort of almost in protest won't buy the X-T30 Mark II because it was kind of a kind of a cheap move on Fujifilm to do that. I'm not, I'm not happy that they did that. And I'm sure even internally um, that some people in Fujifilm weren't happy, but obviously it's an HQ decision in Tokyo. But um, yeah, if I had an X-T30, I would be very disappointed that Fujifilm did that and not offer that firmware update. So anyways, that's all I'll talk about on that front. Um, let's just kind of move on here. They're talking about the autofocus speed on the GFX 50S Mark II is going to be similar to the S100S. It's still not as fast as the X series, but getting better. If you really need fast autofocus, don't buy the GFX. It's not just the autofocus, but also the rolling shutter, which will still have the same issue on the 50S as I saw on the 100S. And so if you want something quick, zippy, fast focus, quick shutter cycle, so being able to shoot from frame to frame, you have to slow down with medium format. And that's just the nature of having a larger sensor, which means a larger uh, shutter and just more processing power. Um, so yeah, we'll talk about that. 6.5 stops. I, I think even the, isn't the 100S only six stops? So this is probably a firmware update. So hopefully the 100 and the 100S will get a firm update. Um, let's just go through here. This is kind of cool, eh? Talking about being able to uh, capture uh, the Milky Way um, and keep the accurate focusing. I think that's, I don't think it's just the focus because the focus is infinity, but keeping the image from being blurry. I think, I think that was a really uh, a cool feature. And, and this 200 megapixel multi shot. And for those of you wondering, why isn't it 400? Because it basically takes four shots per frame and it shifts, micro shifts the, uh, uh, the uh, sensor. So four, uh, 50 megapixels times four is 200. The 100S is 100 megapixels, me megapixels times four. So that's 400 megapixels. So that's kind of um, how you get that 200 megapixel. And hopefully they can bring this multi shot over to the X series as well, so that the uh, the 26 megapixels can get close to 100 megapixels through this uh, this sensor shift technology. And this was I, I will take a look, but they said 100 more improvements on the 50 S Mark II over the original 50. And just like Apple, they kind of flashed a whole bunch of things because they don't have time to go through everything. But this is the 100 improvements, so we'll see what those 100 improvements are. And uh, there you go, 4,000 US for the 50S Mark II, which is a reasonable price, I think, but they gotta drop the price of the original 50S. And if they drop it far enough, meaning like 3,000 US or even less, and if I can get a hand, uh, a hold of one that's even cheaper, like maybe asking Fujifilm, hey, maybe you can sell me your demo model for like, I don't know. Anyways, I don't wanna talk numbers with you, but if I get a good price, I am still willing to get the older 50S, if you can believe it. So let's just see what happens. And let's just see here, I got comments down here. Let me see here. I was intrigued by the 50S Mark II, but not, I was waiting. Same sensor, great contrast. Uh, at 50 megabits, I think full frame is a better option. Yeah, I mean, it depends what you're looking for. If you're just thinking about megapixels, then there are full frames that hit you know close to 50 and even more. But remember about the 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 size of the pixel, the size of the pixel of the uh, 50s Mark II versus a medium uh, a full frame with the same resolution is different. So the image quality is still going to be higher on the 50s, right? The 50s Mark II and the original 50s. Unless you're getting like a Canon 5D, uh, sorry, uh, 1DX Mark, whatever, with that, that has 20 megapixels or 24 megapixels. It's full frame, but it's only 24 megapixels. People are wondering, why is the megapixel count so low? It's because it has good high ISO performance by increasing the size of the pixel, probably close to the medium format, but now you have half the pixels or even less uh, amount of pixels, right? And that's the reason why. So I think the balance of image quality 
to pixel, uh, the resolution to the size of each pixel. The 50s is really a great combination. So, um, but that's still a good point. Um, let's just move on here. The new 35 to 70 zoom lens, it's great for sort of entry level medium formatters and also who wants a light kind of a kit lens. It works out to, I worked it out to be a uh, a 28 to 55 in full frame, or if it was a APS-C lens, it'd be basically an 18 to 35. So it's kind of limiting in terms of range, but in terms of aperture in APS-C, it works out to be equivalent about an F2 to F3 in terms of shallow depth of field. So you can get decent shallow depth of field with full frame, it's basically like an F3.5 to F4.5. But um, it is a collapsible uh, zoom lens. So when it's um, when it's in working mode, it's uh, I don't think I think they showed you in this picture is probably in collapsed mode. And then when it's in shooting mode, you can see it opens up the gap. So it's only when you're traveling it's that compact. And then once you start to um, uh, use it, it opens up like this, right? And so um, and Billy did say that. It's not the sharpest lens wide open. You do have to stop it down. So now instead of f4.5 to 5.6, we're probably talking like f6.7 to f9. And so now you're getting really slow uh, if you want optimum sharpness. Now, I don't think that's why you're buying this lens is for optimum sharpness. But for me then, that's why I would rather have a dedicated 45, 50, or the 63 instead of this, uh, this lens here. So that's just... Uh, for me here um, let's just move on uh, minimum focus distance 35% which is actually pretty darn good for medium format so here's the pricing um, $9.99 for that lens which to me is not worth it I'd rather get the 50 f 3.5 prime lens for the same price um, that's what I would recommend and hopefully they will bundle this uh, GFX 50s mark II with the 50 as an option to the 35 um, and let me see here. And the, the GF 5517, that's uh, kind of, what does that work out to be? I think that I worked that out to be a 45 mil kind of equivalent. So I'm actually kind of excited about this lens, a 55. It is kind of big though. So the 50, uh, the 50, what's here? The 50 F 3.5. It's nice and compact, but F 3.5, this is a 5517, but it's a huge sucker. So I don't know, we'll see. It's not a walk aroundable lens personally. Um, tilt shift, excited about that. It looks like it's gonna be huge, but uh, it's great that you don't need to buy. I still think it's gonna be cheaper to buy a Canon uh, L series tilt shift lens and then just use one of the, um, uh, like Viltrox has an adapter. Let me just bring it here. Um, I haven't had a chance to test it because I didn't have the GFX long enough. Right here, this is a an EF uh, to GFX mount adapter. So uh, if you, I don't know how much vignetting you get, but if you can get a hold of the Canon tilt shift and use this adapter, I don't think the tilt shift lenses were ever autofocus anyway, so it doesn't even have to be a Canon, but any tilt shift lens, uh, full frame, 35 mil, and adapt it, that's probably still a cheaper option, but if you want, um, something that's that's kind of part of the ecosystem and everything works within the ecosystem, then wait for the new upcoming tilt shift. The 20 to 35 sounds pretty exciting. So it's great that they're adding more lenses to the medium format. And let me just see here for comments here. Your uh, Chandler talking about the 50 F1 was the worst purchase I ever made this year. Is it the, the purple fringing or the size and weight? I loved it for low light photography. If you bought it for shallow depth of field and bokeh, I think in my review I did say, look, get the 56 one too. It's, it's, it, it, I couldn't see a difference in, in terms of the shallow depth of field. They just had different bokeh. It looked different. But if that's all you're looking for, but if you're looking for a great low light lens, like I showed some pictures where I'm hand holding at F1, a 15th of a second, a sixth of a second using IBIS on the X-T4, it's mind blowing. But that's where I would say that it's a narrow focus lens in terms of how you can use it. Um, but I still think it's a cool lens and it's great that they were ambitious enough to create a, a knocked. Um, let me just see here. 
Uh, video capabilities, I think that's not a big subject with most of my followers, but it's great that they are expanding uh, Fujifilm's uh, video capabilities. This Tascam system should be compatible with the X-T4 and on Billy's live show, he talked about how they would use the hot shoe inputs for power so you don't need to run batteries through this and it would even share audio. So see the audio uh, camera that's attached to the Tascam, it will use a hot shoe connection. Um, uh, this is all kind of like, this is still on development but if this all works out then you can just run all the info, including audio, through the hot shoe, which is fantastic. So for those of you that shoot video and you're not planning to do medium format video, grabbing the X-T4 and the or the upcoming X-H2, having this Tascam, being able to put XLR connectors, having a hot shoe microphone or a proper XLR microphone and running the audio digitally through the hot shoe and having it uh, recorded. I think you have to use an external device I don't think you can record, I don't think all the features work internally. So you have to record externally, which is great because if you're spending all that time and money buying this external video uh, unit, uh, control unit, you're probably going to be recording out to a, a ninja or some kind of an external hard drive slash monitor device anyway. So I think this is a really cool concept and a cool idea. Um... Yeah, Jay talking about the uh, uh, dedicated tilt shift. It, Fujifilm should do it. Um, you know, when they first came out with the, the the GFX system, and they had I think like I think three or four lenses. Um, they really pushed the adapter because there's not enough lenses, right? So they even made the mount open source, so meaning anyone can copy it and make lenses for it because they were desperate for a variety of lenses. And now that they're really pumping out their own lenses. They even have the large format adapter, which you can, it's beyond tilt shift because you could put a bellows on there and you could do insane things with the bellows that you can't do with the tilt shift. Um, but now it seems like they're not talking about it very much and they're pushing their own lenses, which is great, right? Options is great. So them creating their own tilt shift is great. But if you want it now, I'm just saying that you can get adapters and add the, you know, the most famous ones is probably the Canon L series tilt shift, but even Minolta MD, I think they had a shift lens and I think Nikon has a shift lens. There are like 35 mil shift or tilt lenses or tilt shift lenses, right? They're out there. You just have to adapt it and then make sure there's no vignetting that, that lens in the GFX. And if, even if there is, you just crop in, right? So not a big deal. So yeah, it's a really cool device. I took a lot of pictures of it because I was really interested in this uh, for a lot of my video friends. And you know, here Fujifilm talking about the Zeiss, Tokina, Cosina, Tamron. Um, these Tokina lenses look like Viltrox. What do you guys think? I have uh, the Viltrox um, right here, the uh, the 3314. And man alive, does that look exactly the same as the... Uh, the, the Tokina. So uh, I, I think Tokina is just borrowing the Viltrox design or they actually are just Viltrox lenses. That's my guess. Uh, and I hope Sigma comes on board as well and brings their Pro Art series lenses. Um, let me see here. Debating on the SL2S. That's an entirely different ecosystem. It's almost like um, maybe going from a Lexus to a Porsche. You can sort of look at some of the Lexuses and some of the Porsches and like the high-end Lexus sports cars and stuff and you're looking at Porsche. You can match things, but you're gonna pay way more in the Leica, Leica ecosystem for something of similar spec in Fujifilm. There are some advantages going Leica, including full frame, including the fact that it, the L-Mount Alliance is also working with Sigma and Panasonic, so you have access to all those lenses as well. But um, in terms of even uh, performance, the autofocus on the Leica, because the, the, the L-Mount Alliance with Panasonic, they're using Tower Jazz sensors, which only offers contrast detect at this time. There's no phase detect, so autofocus is still not that great on that sensor. Now in terms of the look, the sensor is great. Very unique, different from Sony sensors, different from Fujifilm, 
which is also made by Sony, but it has the X-Trans layer as well as the film simulation layer on top of that. So it does have a unique look from the Sony look. Um, but uh, yeah, it's very apples and oranges in a way. So we can maybe talk about that in another video, another live maybe. But yeah, um, yeah, different conversation. Personally, I would stick with the, the X system if you are a hybrid shooter. If you are mostly stills, then the SL2 system and the L mount lines make sense. But the SL2S is kind of catered towards videographers. Um, God is in the details. Should become a word. I thought that was kind of cute. 3314. I don't want to talk about this too much because I have three videos on this lens. Um, as well as, um, look at that. Look at all the, I was doing screenshots for this. And I forgot that it will screenshot a second screen as well. So I, I had to delete a lot of the second screen. Um, purity of light. Uh, yeah, I love this lens. It's great. And I am looking forward to the XF23 coming up as well. Um, let me see here. The XT30 Mark II, um, actually it does exist. Um, if you go to B&H, it's already up on their website. Someone maybe can look it up. The price is already up as well. Um, uh, XT30 um, Mark II. Yeah, it's already up on the website. I think it's, well, how much is it? US, $8.99 US. So I don't know what happens to the original XT30. It's, it's still the same. No, it's not the same price. It includes a lens. They dropped it by $100. Um, personally, if you really like the XT30, it's probably worth it to pay the $100 to get the XT30 Mark II. But just remember, it's not a hardware change other than the LCD and the buffer. Or, and maybe there are other smaller differences. It's the same sense, the same processor. They're basically giving the new firmware and charging you a hundred dollar premium for the new firmware, which includes all the new film sims. So to me, it's worth a hundred dollars, but I feel sort of ripped off that they did that. They could have just given the new firmware update to the XT30, or I told this to Billy, charge for the older cameras to get the latest firmware, including all the new um, film simulations and charge 25 bucks or 50 bucks. I would say it's worth it for people to, to have done that. But Fujifilm decided to come up with a Mark II and just kind of not do anything to the camera. So I, I, yeah, I feel disappointed that Fujifilm did that. Um, let me see here. All right, I think I'm caught up kind of guys, but I'm sure I missed some of your comments. I do I do appreciate your, your commenting and hopefully you guys can sort of comment amongst yourselves as well. But I'm gonna try to get through this, um, uh, trying to get through this uh, presentation here. Um, it, it's kind of cool, right? This new lens design. And the 33 and the 23 has the same lens design, 15 elements in uh, 10 groups. They both have, 3ED glass, the extra uh, low dispersion glass with two aspheric elements. And they're talking about how they mirror the uh, the second group uh, with the concave design um, uh, that, that helps with uh, chromatic aberration. And I definitely saw that in the XF33 versus the XF35. And in my video, I showed it, it's quite, a huge difference with the 3514. That eight element in six groups, almost it's almost like a manual focus lens design from the 70s, which is what makes it so sharp. And a lot of Leica lenses are in that eight element, seven element, six element, even five element design. It's the old manual focus uh, design lenses. And with that, there's a lot of positive, right? People love that lens. But one of the weaknesses is chromatic aberration. And this new design uh, right here, the, the 3314, and this is in comparison to the, sorry for my unboxing video. I always, I kind of left the uh, lens hood on because I just think it looks so cool. But the lens hood here, um, remove the lens hood and here is just the lens by itself. And you know, like look, look at the difference between these two lenses but you are getting a, a, a superior optical lens that corrects for more things. But if you shoot in a specific style, 
um, that I mentioned in the video, you still will be happy with this lens. A lot of the pictures, uh, it was very difficult to see the difference until I actually pixel peep, minus chromatic aberration, minus uh, maybe a little bit of light fall off, and minus uh, when you stop down and you get the starburst effect and internal flare and ghosting, you can really see the difference between those lenses. But other than that, it was really hard to see the difference. So, uh, and the 23 also has the same 58 mil filter thread, so you can actually, and I wish that the 18, 23, and the 33 were all developed at the same time, so they would have all shared the same filter thread, but they don't. The 18 is, um, is uh, 62, but the 18 and 35, 33, I mean, they, I mean, I can tell that the, the 18 is, is slightly bigger and slightly heavier, but in video, it's really hard to tell, right? And then the 23 will be basically uh, the same. The 18 does have a kind of a, kind of a, uh, a, a rattling sound, but that just has to do with the, the magnets in here for the linear motor focusing. Once the camera's turned on, that sound disappears. It's less evident on the 33 and I'm sure on the 23. But anyways, looking forward to the, uh, the, the, 20, the, the 23. It's supposed to be on its way. I know Francis got his copy just a couple of days ago and we were talking about it a little bit. And so Toronto Warehouse must have it. So they're probably getting it ready. In fact, if I check my email now, Fujifilm may have already said on its way. Um, so let's just keep on moving through here. Um, let me see here. And also to talk about the positioning of the aperture, uh, the blades there in, in relation to the focusing unit and um, how that also helps with image quality. So um, anyways, 2314. I, I just want, I, I'm so curious. I just want to look at my emails here. Let's just uh, fucking filter through it. Um, no, uh, got some, you got some emails from Fujifilm, but not the one I'm looking for. No, I haven't got word yet on the 23, but hopefully I'll get it this week. And if not next week, and I'll shoot the heck out of that. And since I have the 18 and the 33, I will try to compare all three of them. If I have to return one of the lenses earlier, then I will repeat similar shooting scenarios. Like, you know how I always shoot Dom's Cadillacs at night and, and the, the shopping mall parking lot, the rooftop parking lot. And, you know, I shoot certain things specifically over and over so that it becomes a reference photo. So if I can't have all three, I'll try my best to compare all three of them in a, a similar situation. So anyways, sort of the same thing about the 23 and the 33, the control of chromatic aberration, which is something I really noticed on the 18 and a startling contrast between the 35 and the 33 is that control of the chromatic aberration. And, uh... The 23 has a 19 centimeter minimum focus to the sensor, but to the front of the lens is 10 centimeters. So you're getting, I think, 0.2 macro capabilities, which is amazing that they can do that. And um, let me see here, uh, Yuka, what was she talking, uh, Yukari, what she was she talking about? Uh, oh yeah, she had, I, I took this photo because she had all three, right? The new RLM. Uh, WR lenses. I should have a new name for it. The new Fuji Lux, the new Lux, the new I don't know. The new Fuji Lux series, which hopefully, or maybe not hopefully, but you know the 23 is replaced, right? The older Clutch Focus 23 is gone, replaced the new 23, but they kept the 35 and moved it to a 33, so they wouldn't have to replace it because so many people love the 35, and Fujifilm knew people would complain that they discontinued it, and then you know, it's almost doubled the size and weight and, uh, you know, more expensive. And this is a compromise to make a WR lens, which is what Fujifilm had said previously, that the older lens design of the XF35 was tied to the actual lens construction. And they couldn't just add WR to that older lens design. They had to actually, um, it's kind of hard to explain, um, I, I, I had it explained to me at one point, but just the way that this lens is designed, they couldn't just add modern WR to it. They actually had to, uh, it would change the overall look, size, weight, and the actual optical design if they made this WR. And so that's kind of why they decided to keep the 35 and leave it the way it was, and then create a new 35 and making it into a 33 and then sort of market it, market twist the pitch it in a twist saying it's not a replacement, it's actually a 33. So 
Anyways, um, there will be some birders and sports wildlife photographers that will be interested in this. Um, what's your guess on the aperture on this? Obviously, it won't be a 2.8 throughout. Maybe uh, 3.5 to 5.6? Or 4.5 to 6.7? What do you guys think? I, I'm not interested in it, but I'm sure there will be people that are interested in this lens. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing this and maybe testing it. And I thought it was cool that they talk about creating a video centric lens that's also great for stills an 18 to 120. Um, I don't mind that. Let's, I would rather they broke it up into two lenses like an 18, uh, like a 16 to 55 or a, uh, yeah, 16 to 55 or a 14 to 45 and then a 55 to 150 and then have it either 2.8 or f4 constant. I don't think there. this is going to be an f4 constant. If it is, that's great because if they're saying for movie, it should be a constant aperture. But another thing is also um, you're going to have a problem with because this is probably going to be a, a very focal zoom design, not a par focal, which means focus shifts when you zoom. And so this better be a par focal design. And if not, then it's not good for video. It's not good for movie. Um, and my guess is by looking at the design, um, I hope Fujifilm, if this is supposed to be for a movie, please have it par focal and very little focus breathing. That's what I'm looking for. New G Lux. Yeah, that's funny. But I, I want to put the foo in there. So the new foo, I don't know. I don't know what to do with that. Um, let me just see if I can try to... Uh, Gadge D saying 3556 or 463 for the 150 to 600. Yeah, I mean, think about the 200... Um, F2 with the two times converter makes it F4. 6.3, yeah, 6.3, 6.7. I think that'd be fun. It'd be fun. And then maybe even with this lens, maybe you can put a two times converter or 1.5 times converter. Imagine that. You can put the teleconverters on this as well. That'd be kind of cool. Um, here we go. So pricing, $7.99. I'm actually surprised with $7.99 price. So the XF18 is the most expensive at $9.99, and the 2314 at $8.99, and then the 3314 is $7.99. And I had guessed that the 3314 would sell the best anyways. And now that it's the cheapest, it's more of a reason why it's gonna sell really well. So it'll sell well. It's only $20 more than the than the 3514. You do get a lot more for $200 but also you get a lot more in size and weight, which is gonna be a deal breaker for some that are like X-Pro3 or X-Pro series or XS10 or an XE4 shooter. Like X-Pro3 with a 3514 is just perfect, right? And if I was a still shooter, I can deal with chromatic aberration. If you shoot black and white, you don't even see it, uh, that this is a great combination. But if you are gonna be shooting uh, uh, X-T4, you're shooting video, you want ultimate IQ, then getting the, um, uh, getting the 30, where is it here? The 3314 right here, the 3314 makes sense. And I did have a lot of fun, but I mean, what a huge, I wish I had a scale on me, but what a huge uh, difference in terms of like, just sort of size, but also weight. This is a decent day off camera. This probably isn't. You probably don't want to carry this around on your day off unless you're a really committed photographer. So let's move on here. Uh, so 2022 on the 10 year anniversary. And remember, I think the, the 10 year anniversary, if they're gonna go it to the month, it was, I think, January of 2012. Someone can look that up. I think it was January of 2012 that the X series was announced with the X Pro One and the three lenses. And maybe the XE One was announced at the same time and the X100. But anyways, the X series interchangeable lens mount series was announced in January. So this is being announced now, uh, but it says it will be officially announced in 2022. So look for a probably a January X Summit again, which is great. 
another one coming up in like less than six months. So that's awesome. And the last thing, right? That stacked backside illuminated uh, X-Trans CMOS sensor, which is probably going to be in the X-H2. And the X-H2, a lot of rumors have been around. I've been talking about it for a while. I still have my X-H2. It's still my studio camera. I still do a lot of work with it. And I, I won't sell it for a lot of reasons. One of it was because I got this for the TV show that I did. Fujifilm actually sponsored me for a pilot show that I shot, which the show is buried. It's, it didn't make it to television, but it was fun shooting it. And I needed a, a, a photo sponsor because I was playing myself as a photographer. And Fujifilm said, yes, they would love to sponsor me. And so they sent me this at the time, what was the latest and greatest. And then like a month later, the X-T3 came out. But I still love this. And when the X-H2 comes out, I mean, I want a legacy camera, right? I want to be able to compare it. So uh, X-H2 coming out sometime next year. And this is probably what they're referring to because when they come out with the latest uh the next X X-H2, they're not gonna use the old sensor and processor that's in the current camera bodies. They need something to really wow us. So it's gonna be an X processor five with this new uh, stack layer backside illuminated X-Trans CMOS sensor. It'll have amazing uh, uh, control of rolling shutter, which would be great for video. Um, rolling shutter on APS-C is not that bad anyways, but it will be even better. And almost like you could probably shoot in uh, electronic mode more often when things are moving reasonably fast. Something super fast, you should not use rolling shutter, but something reasonably uh, moving around with the sensor, you probably will be able to get away with electronic shutter. And as well as um, um, probably up to somewhere between 40 and 45 megapixels. That's probably what's gonna happen. And this is probably co-developed with Sony. And um, yeah, I'm excited about this. So I'm gonna now, um, let me see here. I'm gonna um, get to OBS, go full video mode. All right. And now move the YouTube up here. So now I can talk to you guys. I got rid of that. Um, thanks for all your comments here. Um, if I missed anything, I do apologize. How long have I been talking for? Um, does it give me how long I've been talking for? It doesn't, I, I don't see it. Uh, how long have I been talking for, guys? Uh, I'm gonna try to catch up here by looking at your comments. I'm hoping the 18 to 120 will be faster than F4. I, 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 I do too, but if you look at the 16 to 55, much narrower range, and that's already too big and heavy for me. I'm like I didn't buy it because I'm like, no, it's just too big and heavy. I, I don't want it. So I think it'll be an F4, to be honest. It'll probably be an F4. I've never seen a lens of that range of 18 to 120 and it being F2.8. I've never seen it. And if it is, it'll just be an hu a humongous lens. And so as much as we want F2.8, it's probably gonna be F4. Um, excited for the X-H2, yeah, I'm, I'm pumped. When everyone was saying before the X-H2 is dead, I'm like, I don't, I don't think it's dead. Cause I, you know, I, I do communicate with Fujifilm uh, on a semi reasonable regular basis and the internal buzz. Cause you know, sometimes Fujifilm Canada, Fujifilm US, Fujifilm UK, Fujifilm Australia, they give their feedback to Tokyo. And sometimes Tokyo says, thank you for your input, but Thanks, no thanks. We're gonna go this way. And even someone like uh, Jonas Rask, Jonas Krask, um, he has his own personal opinions, right? And even he says, "Look, I asked for this, but they gave us this instead." And so, you know, it's great that they listen. Some brands just don't listen. But then ultimately, Fujifilm HQ still makes their final decision. And I knew that everyone was fighting for the X-H2. Everyone's like, no, it's not the same as the X-T series. It's very different. Videographers love it. They love the deep grip. Um, they love the IBIS, but let's just make it more video centric. And the X-T4 is kind of like the, so now Fujifilm has three <laughs> sort of uh, pro level cameras, right? The X-Pro series, stills focus. The X-H series, more video centric. And then the XT series, which is sort of both, best of both worlds. 
And so it made sense to keep the XH, and I'm glad Fujifilm did. And no one should complain. Like, why do you care if an XH2 exists? If you don't like it, don't buy it. I mean, Fujifilm has such a wide range of cameras based on a single sensor and processor, which is great. I just wish they do more with the firmware updates. Again, XT30, um, very disappointed that they came up with a Mark II and gave the latest firmware. They could have given the latest firmware on the XT30. They could have easily done that. So I'm disappointed and I'm sure a lot of people internally at Fujifilm are also disappointed that they did that because I know a lot of people that I recommended the XT30 and told them, wait, wait, you know, like hopefully they'll give you firmware updates soon. And now they just said, no thanks. Just buy the XT30 Mark II and pay the extra $100. I would almost say if they charged $100 for the, that would be too much. If they charged up to $50, so anywhere between $25 to $50 to an XT30, say, hey, look, if you want the latest firmware, it takes up a lot of time and resources for us to update the older cameras. But if there's enough XT30 shooters out there that signed a petition and there's a, you know, whatever. 10,000 of you guys and you all said you would pay up to $25 for a former update uh, to do it. I mean, that's $250,000, right? $25 times 10,000 shooters to, to create a firmware update that you guys will pay for. We will do it, right? I mean, I don't know. Anyways, what do you guys think? The old days of the Kaizen update, I think is dead. That's what I kind of wrote. It's not dead. I think has, has shifted. Because when Fujifilm had very few cameras and the update to the next camera would take years, um, Fujifilm used firmware as a way to improve the camera's performance without having to come up with a new camera. And now Fujifilm is like, now that they're getting the sales and now that they have the engineering uh, background and now they're building up upon older design like you know they've created the ibis unit no need to start a new ibis unit ground up right they just get the existing and make it bigger and put it in the 100 the gfx 100 and then take the same unit make it smaller and put it in the xs10 so they don't need to start from scratch and because of that they have this built up of technology built up of knowledge built up of engineering understanding and architecture that they can like for instance the gfx 50s uh, Mark II, they just took the older sensor from the 50S, put it in the body of the GFX 100S, and then just tweaked the firmware and then the same IBIS unit, right? And so how much work was that for Fujifilm? Not very much. And so because of that, the price point actually could be even less than $399.99. How about $34.99? I think that would have been the sweet spot, wouldn't it? And then maybe with that lens, make it $399.99 that would have just really broken that barrier uh, for entry for a lot of people who are shooting full frame that want to get into medium format or those of us that are X-series shooters that want to get into medium format. I think that would have been that sort of sweet spot. Uh, but uh, anyways, I I'm kind of going all over the place. Let me um, look at your comments here. Uh, Jay Graffer, can you explain why rolling shutter is a deal breaker when we will use mechanical most of the time? Um, yeah, it, uh, for videographers, for people who shoot video rolling shutter, because for video, the shutter is open, right? So it has to use uh, the, the global shutter that's built in. And so that makes a, a big difference and it makes a bigger difference in medium format as well. Um, uh, because, uh, the shutter is maxed out at one four thousandth of a second. And that's where I'm saying the GFX 100 S. Um, that they didn't improve the mechanical end of things too much. Like the shutter um, cycle is about the same as the older. So it takes just as long to shoot one photo. And as well as the top shutter speed, the top flash sync speed, I think it's 1 one twenty fifth or something like that. It's not that fast. And um, so I would love to see that GFX uh, shutter increase to 1 eight thousandth of a second. So when the GFX, I did find that... Um, I was going into electronic shutter more often because if I wanted to shoot wide open and I didn't want to use ND filters and, uh, and that's another thing, right? If they could have built in ND filters in interchangeable lens cameras, like something that swings out, I think that would be awesome. Um, that, uh, the global shutter thing, uh, the rolling shutter thing would make a difference. 
So the XS10 is still better than the XT30 Mark II? Well, better depends on what. That's a good video. Quickly, XS10 has IBIS. The XT30 does not, the Mark II. Same firmware, right? So day-to-day -day shooting. XT30 Mark II, if the chassis is exactly the same, which I think it is, because again, saving money, right? Just like Apple, use the same body, right? And then call it uh, the iPhone SE, but it's actually an iPhone 8, right? Um, but um, way more button control. The XT30 has, uh, um, does it have a D-pad? I can't remember now if it has a D-pad. I don't think it has a D-pad, but it has both front and rear uh, dials. I'm just looking up the XT30 right now. Haven't shot with it in a long time. Um, let me see here. It has both front and rear dials. Both front and rear dials are push in, so it's an extra custom function. It doesn't have a D-pad, it has a joystick but it also has double dials on the top. Um, it has a pop-up flash. Let me see here. It has the, um, the focus control dial, the manual, continuous, and the single, which the XS10 does not have. It also has the view mode button right by the viewfinder, so you can switch between LCD only, EVF only, um, EVF and, LCD, eye control, all those buttons are there so you have more freedom to uh, customize the, your custom functions. And so in terms of ergonomics, the X-T30 and the X-T3 Mark II is better than the X-S10. The only thing with the X-S10 uh, that I think is IBIS and that deep grip, which is actually really sweet. Um, Take putting in all the work today. Yeah, it's been a busy couple of weeks. Uh, they should provide all new film sims to all cameras that support them. Yeah, they should. It is a lot of work to do the firmware. I talked to Billy about it. He said, you know, even just one aspect of it, he said the actual surf software firmware update itself is easier than translating it into the, whatever, the eight to 12 languages that they have to update the firmware and updating all the... Uh, virtual manuals, right? Updating all of that and the existing cameras that are already in the boxes, you'd have to create an addition uh, to update. You have to put it in the boxes saying, you know, there are new features added since this camera was made and this physical paper manual was made. Go to web the website for an updated PDF file. So all that stuff takes time and labor. So they'd have to take two or three or four people out of one department, move them into just the firmware department and update it all. And if the camera is no longer in production, but it's already in the stores, so it's retail available, but no longer in production, Fujifilm has pulled those people off of that X-T30 team and put them onto the X-S10 team and having to pull them back just to do a firmware update, I understand why. And that's why the Kaizen update on the GFX 50 50R and the 100 that added the new film simulations to these much older cameras was more of a political slash sales slash marketing decision than something that they did out of the goodness of their heart because they're still pushing the GFX as a system. And so they wanted to make sure to have the latest um, firmware update with the latest uh, film simulations where the X series, they rarely do that. They rarely go back. Like even the X Pro 3 doesn't have the nostalgic nag. It doesn't have the some of the newest ones that are in the latest cameras. And they might do it eventually to the X100V and the X Pro 3, but I don't think they'll go further back. Like the X-T3, and the X-T30, I think, is abandoned. They just will not give the latest firmware update to those two cameras, um, even though they, it started at all, right? The X-T3 is a great camera. I just wish it had the latest firmware update with all the new film sims. But it looks like maybe they'll do an X-T3 Mark II, which should be another silly thing to do. Just give us a firmware update, guys. A lot of pros bought the X-T3, uh, and that was a gateway camera to a lot of people into the X series system. So, um, Mac Mac saying the new sensor is probably going to be the XH2. I don't think the XT5 is going to come out before the XH2. The XH2 is probably going to be the next camera. Because between the XH1 and then the XT3 came out uh, like five or six months later, and then the XT4 came out. 
Um, even though the X-H1 came out before the X-T3, so I think the X-T5 will come out after the X-H2. I think the X-H2 is going to be the next flagship, like the new camera that will have the latest, greatest sensor and processor. Because the X-Pro2 was the first camera to get the X-Processor Pro, which is the third iteration of that, of that processor, and the new, at the time, 24 megapixel X-Trans sensor. And then for the next leap, it was the X-T3 that got the X-Processor 4 and the new 26 megapixel backside illuminated X-Trans CMOS sensor. And then I think the next leap will be the X-H2 with the latest sensor and the latest X-Processor 5 is probably what they're gonna call it. A JGrapher for video or small dock work, would you use the new X audio XLR item they showed in the presentation or is it overhyped? No, I think for video guys, so when I work with uh, guys like Ryan from Arcade Original, Chris from Chris Meets Chris, uh, Nima from The Glass Eye, these guys are using Canons, they're using Sony's, and even the, um, the, the Panasonic GH4 series had one of those little adapters that they put on the hot shoe, right? That had XLR inputs and it had all these extra control features that a, a pro videographer would use. So someone like me, I wouldn't use it. But if you are doing, uh, if you're like a small uh, documentary production company, like guys that I just mentioned, um, they would definitely buy it. So it's not for someone like me, but uh, for someone who's into to video, it would be definitely something that they would, uh, uh, get into so I, I definitely don't think it's hype it is something that will be useful for those that Fujifilm are trying to attract which are video centric people uh, that growing market of videographers not only in the YouTube realm but in wedding photography in doing uh, conference calls zoom calls in doing trade shows uh, that's a huge market that's where the growth is with the x system and i'm sure with other series as well so the as you can see a shift in fujifilm that they're really pushing video centric features it's because that's where they're seeing a lot of the growth um those of us that are still shooters we we aren't part of the growth meaning we've always been around since 2012 right so they appreciate us but we're not new growth we're just existing clientele but the new people that are jumping on board they're jumping on board because of this hybrid uh, video and steels feature. So the X-T3 was one of the things, right? A lot of guys that would have never thought of shooting with Fujifilm for video, the X-T3 was that gateway into the Fujifilm X-Series. And so since then, they've been really pushing video features, including in medium format. So um, they are really pushing video because that is kind of like the future of this sort of um, mirrorless uh, ecosystem in the digital realm is is hybrid shooting between videos and stills and even Leica right Leica's with the SL2S they're pushing video so even Leica is pushing video which is kind of a, a big statement um, Shind Shindri Athal uh, but the firmer yeah it's sad I don't want to criticize Fujifilm too much. I understand that they use it as a tool early on, but now with so many cameras, I think I counted at the time 14 or 15 cameras that can potentially get firmware updates. I think there's eight recently released cameras. Um, that's a lot of cameras for them to manage firmware updates. And you know, most manufacturers don't give the type of firmware updates that Fujifilm does at this time anyways. Everyone else actually kind of caught up to what Fujifilm was doing because they looked foolish for not giving firmware updates. But I think Fujifilm has backed off a li little bit while other manufacturers have kind of kicked it up a notch. But I think Fujifilm is still a little bit above most manufacturers when it comes to the generosity of uh, firmware updates. Oh, Chris, you just bought the 2314, awesome. I think I'll get, yeah, and you know, it's a November release. And you know, in the X um, Summit, they had pre-recorded it obviously, they had said uh, the 33 had a September release. Uh, I got notes. Uh, I got a message from Fujifilm saying it's actually been pushed to October. So if you really want that new 3314, if you use any of my affiliate links, I'd appreciate it. Just go to, if you use B&H or if you use uh, Amazon or Moment, just use the general link. And then if you find the lens, that'll help me out. I appreciate it. I'll make a lot of money from affiliate links, but it definitely pays for these sort of things uh, to do. 
and uh, you know it helps to keep my brand afloat. Um, but um, it's been pushed. Let me just find the exact push date, guys. Um, uh, we got an email from Fujifilm Canada, and remember, each country does also have different release dates. Um, so yeah, so the original embargo sales embargo for the thirty three one four was September 23rd, right? So late September. So we were going to expect it in just like three weeks or so. But it's been pushed later to October 21st. So almost a month later. So that's a big deal. So if you want the 3314, um, it's a great lens. Um, if you have any more fine-tuned questions, go to my YouTube videos and ask them because I'm probably going to miss them on the live here um, if you want to make the decision. But it's probably going to sell out, to be honest. Maybe if place place like B&H and stuff has kind of generous pre-order return policies, whatever, just go and pre-order it. And then if you find that you don't want it, then just remove the pre-order if that's even possible. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. But uh, October 21st. So I think the first batch is probably already sold out. Fujifilm is still backordered on the 18 one for, and that was released a few months ago. I tried to buy it from Fujifilm. They said backordered. You have to put your money down now because there's none in stock in Canada at the Fujifilm warehouse. Some retailers might have it in stock. Even locally, a lot of the stores only had one or two in stock and they immediately just sold out. But uh, sales embargo for the 3314 is October 21st. So that's a two-month, almost a two-month wait for that lens. And then the XF23 is a November release. And so who knows if that hasn't been pushed out even further to maybe even December or something like that. So this we're talking about the holiday season push out. And I think that's kind of the reason why Fujifilm was smart in doing this X Summit Prime now is that you can save up and think like, you know what, new iPhone 13 or the 3314. It's like, I'm going to buy the 3314. And I know some of you guys were thinking about that. So I think Fujifilm was smart to announce these things early and get them in the hands of reviewers like me um, so that you guys can make a decision now going into Techtober, deciding, you know, are you going to buy a new MacBook? Are you going to buy a new iPhone? Are you going to buy the new Galaxy Flip or the Galaxy Fold? Are you going to buy any of the new whatever, right? Whatever new things are coming out, you're starting to sort of reserve your money for what you want to get. And so Fujifilm was smart to let us all know what's happening in, in the Fujifilm ecosystem. So you can say, I'm going to save for the 33 and the 23. And if you have the money... I think it's money well spent, especially if you like the 23 and the 33 um, field of view in APS-C. And if you don't mind the extra weight and size, you will be rewarded with superior image quality. Not necessarily way sharper lenses, because I didn't see that with the 33. It is sharper, but at 100, 200% magnification is when I can notice it. But when you zoom out to regular, it's like, I, I, don't, I don't see it that it's, it's way sharper. But micro contrast is better, and really the control of uh, chromatic aberration is stellar on the new lenses. So that's where you're gonna see the difference. Um, was hoping for a Mark II GFX 50R, yeah, because they wouldn't do it because they need a new body for that, right? For the 50R Mark II, they already had a new body with the GFX 100S. Like I said, Fujifilm had to do absolutely nothing to create the 50S Mark II, right? They already have the sensor. They already have the IBIS mech and the body from the 100S. All they had to do was like flip the sensor into the newer body. So in terms of manufacturing, there's no manufacturing difference other than the stamping of the name of the new body uh, into the camera, the top chassis, the magnesium chassis. Other than that, there was no need to update. But the 50R, they would have to bottom up redesign, right? Because, you know, you guys would probably want IBIS in the new 50R and you probably would want the new battery that's in the um, X-T4 uh, in the 50R. Because I think that's kind of where Fujifilm is going to move towards the NPW-126S for the smaller bodies, right? And then the NPW-235 for the pro bodies like the X-T4, the upcoming X-H2 and all the GFX cameras. My guess is moving forward, we'll use the NPW-235, the new battery. So that's the... Um, for those who are wondering, like, what's Tuck is shooting off all those numbers? This is the, um, um, yeah, the older NPT125 battery was a weird battery. It's basically one and a half of these batteries here, the MPW126S, and this is the new 
um, NP W235 battery here is not much bigger, but it actually is way more power, way more juice uh, in this battery here. So it is bigger. So that's why the the uh, XS10 didn't have it, but I think it could fit in there and the XT4 can fit it, but the grip, it had to go this way like that. So um, yeah, and then the GFX 100S uses this uh, newer battery as well. So I'm glad, and I, and I think what Fujifilm's gonna move towards is these the, a two battery system, right? So the X100 is gonna keep on using this, X Pro 3 or the X Pro series, Anything that needs to be light and compact is going to use this battery. Anything that needs more power is going to use these uh, newer batteries here. Um, and I'm sure I missed a lot of your comments, guys. I do apologize, but I'm losing my voice. And so thanks for joining. And uh, look for more videos coming up. Um, like I said, I have the X... Um, XF23 on its way, and I did just order the GFX. I mean, there's a lineup, right? There's a lineup for the 50S Mark II. A lot of people in Canada would want it. I don't think I'm the highest priority. DP review will be the highest priority, and then the TCS guys, and then probably, I don't know who else will be the next priority, but I would rather have the 2314 than the 50S Mark II anyways, because I pretty much know what I'm gonna get, right? I'm gonna get the body of the GFX 100S with the IBIS, with the same sensor of the 50S. And so in terms of photos, I'll be out there taking photos, but the image quality is gonna look exactly the same as the 50S. I'm, I'm, I know what I'm gonna get, but the shooting experience obviously gonna be different because of the IBIS. And so I do look forward to reviewing that, but I'm more looking forward to reviewing the 2314 since it's replacing the older 1.4, right? It's that, that older lens is gone now. Clutch focus is probably dead. And um, the, so probably the 1614 will probably have a Mark II version eventually. I'm not sure if they'll change the optics of that. Um, and as well as the 5612, I hope there'll be a new version of it with um, WR and the new features on it. And hopefully they won't touch the optics. But anyways, thank you so much for watching. Again, this really cool... Uh, t-shirt from Francis from uh, the Francis the Fuji guy thanks for making the shirt for for me and for others and uh, keep on asking your question if I missed your questions once the video my live video goes on regular YouTube then comment in the regular section not in this live chat section but thanks for watching and happy shooting you hear that autofocus It, it's, it bugs me, but on the street, I don't hear it. Autofocus acquisition is not bad on the newer bodies, as I mentioned, but definitely way faster on the new lens. But for street photography, who cares? F4, scale focus, zone focus, and you're done. Thanks for watching, guys. Talk to you soon. And I'm going to stay on a little bit on the chat, so you can still keep on commenting. But that's it. End streaming now.